Oh, just this one. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our, our second in the, uh, the, the semester's length of Astro Public Outreach Nights. So uh, you guys are all here, so you've heard about it somehow. Um, we, we have, our, we'll start out with, well, first I have to yap for a couple of minutes, but uh, then we'll have Sebastian Pineda give a wonderful talk about the aurora that you can see here and on other planets in the solar system. Um, That'll last about 30 minutes, and then we'll have kind of a brief intermission in here. You guys are welcome to stick around in here. You're welcome to go outside onto the field. You'll just exit the front door, go right, and then walk past the, the building here. And on the right side, there will be a gate that you can enter onto the field directly behind us where the telescopes are being set up right now. Uh, the weather looks relatively clear. There's a little haze, as you probably noticed. It, it was hard to see the San Gabriel Mountains today. Uh, but it shouldn't be too problematic for the sorts of things that we're going to be observing. The Moon, Jupiter, the Pleiades, uh, the Orion Nebula, maybe Alcor and Mizar, a few different things. So it should be good. And while that's going on, we'll set up in here. There will be kind of an informal Q&A session with several of the astronomers here in the department, uh, both graduate students and postdocs to answer just general questions that you might have about astronomy, astrophysics, science in general. Uh, so, so yeah, we're, we're happy to answer those. That will go on until roughly 10, but feel free to stay as long as you want. If, well, not past 10, but, but uh, if you get bored with us or you're hungry or you need to leave, that's, that's totally fine. You can get up and walk out. We won't be offended. Uh, and yeah, so a quick question for everyone. Uh, how many of you, raise your hand if you are generally affiliated with Caltech as a student or a faculty member or staff or spouse of a staff member or something like that? <laughs> okay, so 20% uh, maybe, 15%, not that many. Uh, and raise your hand if you heard about this event from the Caltech newspaper, from our website, okay, a few, from social media, Okay. From a friend? Okay. Any other things that people want to shout out that they heard about us from in some unique way? No? Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, and I forgot to mention, I'm Cameron. Uh, I, I, I anou I, I've organized this uh, last month and, and this month now, uh, and I'm a postdoc here, but that's not really important. So you guys are here for the science. So. Uh, so without further ado, uh, our speaker tonight is Sebastian Pineda. Uh, he did his undergraduate degree at MIT. He's now a graduate student in the department, finishing up this spring, finishing up getting his PhD. And he'll be starting uh, in the fall as a postdoctoral researcher at UC Boulder, a really good department there. So uh, he's going to wow us with his talk on the Aurora tonight. And uh, please welcome him. Hey, Cameron, uh, can I, is, this, is this loud enough? We're good? All right. Um, thank you all for coming to the public lecture series uh, this month. So today, I, I want to talk a little bit about the um, amazing phenomena that is the northern and southern lights. Um, so you see the, an example here in this background image I show for the title slide. Um, but to really get a, a sense of what we're showing, um, let me actually show you a movie of this. Let me dim the lights quick. Um, so I, I set up this clip from uh, this video by Alexis Corum. Uh, she took this video of the Aurora from uh, part of uh, Alaska, and this was actually featured in a uh, short film showcase by National Geographic. So let me just uh, play this. Let's see. Thank you. 
this was on for a while, but um, <laughs> uh, it's just really, really, really amazing. Um, one of the things I want to uh, point our attention to is that you can see all these different colors, mostly green, uh, but we also saw hues of red, a little bit there, uh, and pink. So the real question is, uh, where uh, do these colors come from? What's actually causing ca these lights in the atmosphere? Um, <clears throat> so I'm showing here is, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, is a uh, atmosphere profile showing the contents of our atmosphere. So we have uh, molecular nitrogen, and here's oxygen. Um, now, at the local level, uh, where we are like right now, the predominant uh, gases are molecular hydrogen, sorry, <laughs> molecular nitrogen and molecular oxygen. Um, but up here, uh, about you know, 100 kilometers up, uh, 200 kilometers up, where the typical aurora are, which is what uh, this uh, red swath there is in the middle, is where uh, so, so we, have, we see the aurora, and the dominant species are molecular nitrogen and, and atomic oxygen, as opposed to molecular oxygen. So the colors that we're actually seeing are come, come from the uh, emission of these excited gases uh, in this part of the atmosphere. Um, and for a, a comparison, the International Space Station actually orbits at about 350 kilometers. That's uh, 220 miles, uh, roughly. Um, <clears throat> so these are actually really high up. Um, and these gases actually uh, determine what we're actually seeing. So how does that work? Well, if we consider uh, excited atomic oxygen, what I'm showing here is a spectrum of uh, the, this gas. Um, the dotted lines here on the left and to the right denote the visible range of the spectrum that we can see with our eyes uh, between 390 nanometers and uh, 700 nanometers. So we can see you know, wavelengths of light that are in this range. And the excited gas of atomic oxygen emits very strongly in this uh, green line here. So the taller the line, the, relative, the brighter it is relative to uh, other lines. Um, we also note, I also see, note that this uh, red line here at about 630 nanometers, this is like 558, um, is also an uh, important contributor to the uh, auroral emissions here for this uh, excited uh, atomic uh, oxygen gas. Um, so what we're seeing in the green light is predominantly this oxygen. Um, and then some of the red is from uh, the red part of the oxygen as well. Um, but uh, the molecular nitrogen also has a contribution here. And so I'm showing the same, same kind of spectrum. There's a visual range. Um, you can see that it's the molecular nitrogen spectrum is actually quite different. Molecular, molecular nitrogen contributes uh, emission here in the blue region and uh, in the deeper red. So <clears throat> it's quite different. And actually, the molecular nitrogen also has a lot, a strong contribution outside of the visible range that we can see. So uh, in here in the far infrared, or infrared, and then in ultraviolet here. And we can't see this, but when this gas is emitting uh, in this auroral uh, way, uh, this light is... Uh, being shown, but we can't actually perceive it. Um, <clears throat> so how are these gases being excited? What's actually happening when we see these lights? Um, as a sort of a schematic, um, the source of the excitation for the gas um, <clears throat> are energetic electrons. So how does, how does this work? <clears throat> so you can take it as an example, uh, electron, see this little blue circle, Zips, comes zipping in and then knocks into this oxygen atom. Um, what happens is the oxygen atom uh, absorbs some of the en energy from that collision, goes to this excited state, the electron keeps moving, and then uh, it may potentially collide with other uh, gases, creating additional excitations. Um, now, if this excited oxygen atom is left alone for a little bit, it's given enough time, it actually emits that energy as light. Um, so it's these kinds of collisions that we're seeing uh, when we see the northern lights. So <clears throat> now there's oxygen, there's this nitrogen. What the blend of colors that we end up seeing then depends on uh, the relative concentration of the two uh, compounds and where in the atmosphere the uh, aurora are taking place. So, if, you know, if 
it's deeper in the atmosphere here in these really lower layers, you have a lot more nitrogen relative to oxygen. So, <clears throat> and sometimes it's, it's a little bit rare. You can actually see the uh, bluer and maybe the deep red, uh, maybe uh, purplish hues below the green curtains. Um, this only happens in the strongest aurorae where these electrons can plow through the atmosphere and actually reach these lower levels. But higher up, um, you know, in, in these middle regions, it's very dominated by the oxygen, which is emitted more strongly. Uh, and higher up, um, <coughs> we saw maybe near the tips of the top, uh, more red, like some of the reddish hues, and that's the oxygen at the higher levels that has enough time in the lower density environment to emit the uh, red radiation, and that's what we saw. So, <coughs> to, uh, the question sort of remains, you know, where are these electrons coming from? What, what's uh, the source of that energy? Why are they so energetic? Why are they uh, generating these emissions in the uh, Earth's atmosphere? Let's look at that. Um, for, let's look at what these uh, aurora look at like from space. Give a, a perspective on that. Um, <clears throat> I'll play this clip from uh, this, now. This is the ISS uh, orbiting around, and then you can see the aurora uh, below it. Let's take a look. see the sun's rising there. <laughs> so we actually see th saw there was that over large swaths of uh, the planet's surface, these aurorae are, are present. Um, so we can actually like step, take a step back and look at this a little from a more distant vantage point. Um, <clears throat> so you can see the whole auroral oval over Antarctica uh, in this image here taken from a satellite. Um, <clears throat> now what this is telling us in this, you know, large oval pattern and the broad region of the Earth that uh, this aurora are taking place is that the emission has, must have something to do with the magnetic field of the Earth. Uh, and, and that's crucial. The other thing that we have observed is that the strength and the prevalence of these auroral emissions actually much stronger when the sun is more active. So, <clears throat> There must be some link between the Earth and the Sun that's uh, related to this phenomenon. Um, so let's uh, see what that looks like. So <clears throat> let's give, play a short video. Um, the idea is that the Earth's aurora are caused by interaction with the solar wind. So let's, let's, let's watch this. So that's where we see the Sun. Um, the star, 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 <laughs> sunspots. Uh, that's the blue here is the a visualization of the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, solar wind is coming in, is distorting the magnetic field region. You can see that the field gets compressed, and then when they meet, it snaps, and then the, uh, the light you saw there is to represent the energetic electrons that are being accelerated into the Earth's atmosphere. So let's see that again. Uh, and this is the solar wind. Uh, you see the magnetic field being distorted. Starting to pinch here. And then this here, that's known as reconnection. And you see the electrons streaming into the polar regions, and then they're shown schematically there. Uh, so, uh, as a, uh, over a diagram summarizing uh, the clips we just saw, um, solar wind comes in, again, distorts the magnetic field, creates these reconnection events, which that's the snapping of the magnetic field lines, uh, and that generates um, the 
aurora emission in the atmosphere once the electrons which are energized hit the atmosphere. So what's interesting is that the pressure of the solar wind is also variable, and it can increase during uh, outbursts like flares um, and coronal mass ejections. So during these kinds of events in the sun, you can have much stronger and more advanced uh, auroral emissions. Uh, maybe you can see the, the nitrogen uh, emissions in the, uh, below the green curtains. Um, a point of historical note, actually, uh, when these things are really strong, the region of... Uh, of the Earth, from which you can actually see the aurora, actually extends to lower and lower latitudes. Um, so, in like the mid 19th century, there's this huge flare, and you can see aurora down, um, like near the equator, actually, which is really interesting. It was a really massive event. Um, it's called the Carrington Flare. So, if you're interested in that, you look that up. Um, but <clears throat> the main ideas here are that we have a uh, interaction of the solar wind with, with the magnetic field of the Earth, an acceleration of these energetic electrons. Those are funneled by the magnetic field into the atmosphere. Those electrons collide with the gases in the atmosphere. Those gases get excited, and then they emit that energy as light in the uh, aurora. Now, um, these are the sort of basic uh, physical processes, and they actually occur throughout the solar system. So not only on the Earth, but uh, other planets. So our next stop uh, is, is actually going to be Mars. Um, so Mars, uh, like pretty similar to the Earth, is a terrestrial planet. Um, but some key differences. So excuse me, the uh, Martian atmosphere is predominantly carbon dioxide, um, in contrast to the Earth, which is uh, mostly nitrogen. And uh, important to note is that there's no global magnetic field on Mars, um, <clears throat> the way we saw in the schematic just now for, for the Earth. The thing is, we, we've actually been observing, observing, <laughs> observing Mars for quite some time. We have rovers there, uh, a lot of robotic instruments, satellites, actually taking a look at uh, Mars, but we're actually always learning new things. So <clears throat> I'll show a picture here of this uh, satellite, which is called MAVEN, which is one of more recent uh, missions to Mars, uh, designed to explore uh, and learn about the uh, Martian atmosphere. And actually, we only just learned using this instrument, and it was confirmed last year that Mars has uh, ultraviolet aurora. Uh, we can't see it, but uh, this instrument and the satellite was able to detect it, which is really interesting. So how, how did that happen? Well, um, <clears throat> so what I'm showing here now is a projection of the Martian surface. So you can see the, these correspond to latitudes, uh, north and south. Uh, and this is uh, longitude. So up here was the, would be the polar regions. Um, and now these, this purple uh, is the detections of UV aurora on Mars by MAVEN. Uh, what's interesting here is that it spans the broad swaths of uh, the surface at relatively low latitude. Um, the Earth's aurora only, would be only be up here along the, the, north, like the top edge and the, the south edge. But these are middle latitudes um, to be seeing uh, this, these, are, this, these aurora. <clears throat> so, yeah, this is a direct consequence of the different configurations of the magnetic fields between Mars and the Earth. So, to illustrate this, um, <clears throat> show here the uh, magnetic fields of Earth and Mars uh, in blue. Uh, you see this ordered, uh, uh, this is very good. Let's see. See if I have a better one. Yeah, better. Okay. Um, you can see these loops uh, from the magnetic field, and on Mars, these is, are very different. They're very open. Um, th this, you know, protects uh, the Earth from uh, solar radiation and in the solar wind, in, in that sense. Whereas this is very open. Uh, so when uh, solar wind, because we're active, and you have these uh, episodes like CMEs, these flaring events. Um, they can strike broad regions of Martian surface, whereas those comparable events on the Earth would only affect the poles because they're being funneled by the uh, dipolar magnetic field. That's what this uh, pattern is called. Um, so <clears throat> if you were to see uh, most anywhere on, on, on Mars, you can potentially have these aurora taking place. So, <clears throat> so I'm referring here to the UV aurora, which we detected. 
Um, but that sort of brings up the question, what might we see uh, if we were on Mars based on the chemistry of the Martian uh, atmosphere? Well, <clears throat> simulations have shown that it actually might be bluish. So this is an artist's impression. Say you're on Mars, you look up, you see these blue aurorae in the Martian night sky. Um, <clears throat> I think that'd be pretty cool if you're like living on Mars, um, uh, looking up maybe during a strong solar uh, moment of activity, uh, you see these blue aurorae. So you can confirm that in the simulation uh, showing the actual spectrum. So again, uh, this region on this side is uh, corresponds to the visible, and just like I showed before, the this is the would be the auroral spectrum of the Martian atmosphere um, <clears throat> when it's going up. So the strongest lines of radiation correspond to these blue regions uh, of the visible spectrum. So <clears throat> I think that's kind of interesting. Um, we haven't seen the visible Martian aurorae uh, yet. Uh, but I think this is a really cool prediction, and ho hopefully it'll, it'll happen one day. So now I want to move on to the uh, outer solar system, uh, in particular to the two gas giants, uh, Saturn and Jupiter. Um, <clears throat> now these are very different from uh, Mars and Earth uh, in two pretty important ways. Like Mars and Earth, there's a surface where you can walk, and uh, as a terrestrial planet, these gas giants don't have anything comparable, so you can't sit somewhere like in, on Jupiter and like look at the aurora. That's not uh, going to work. Um, but um, maybe you can imagine uh, staying on one of these moons and watching the, the Saturn's aurora. <laughs> um, that's for another age, I think. Um, but let's, <clears throat> let's talk about Saturn first. So it's so a six planet from the sun, predominantly a hydrogen atmosphere, and <clears throat> a large global magnetic field, uh, similar in uh, configuration to the Earth, but much stronger. Um, <clears throat> and uh, planets like Saturn have benefited, or we have benefited greatly in learning about planets like Saturn through uh, orbital missions like Cassini, which is currently orbiting Saturn, and a source of a lot of our uh, really amazing pictures of Saturn. Um, and we've actually learned a, a ton uh, from these kinds of missions. So what do the Saturn aurora look like? So now I'm showing here these images of Saturn's UV aurora uh, from the, their hydrogen atmosphere. I'm seeing these different, uh, these, each of these images were taken on different days uh, using the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, the UV aurora here uh, are superimposed on optical images also taken uh, by, Hu by Hubble. You can see the same uh, ring pattern, or the oval pattern, along the pole of Saturn. Uh, actually, it's, it's really, really interesting here. Um, you see how <clears throat> it changes in the different days. And what's cool was this study confirmed um, that, like Earth, Saturn's aurora are predominantly modulated by activity from the sun. So what they did was they monitored the density and the pressure of the solar wind, essentially, during these observations and noted that you know, this flare-up occurred um, and coincided with an increase in the pressure from the solar wind. So the energetic electrons are impacting this hydrogen atmosphere. And they actually produce this UV aurora, which I just showed. Uh, they also produce optical uh, red aurora, uh, deeper red than what's seen on Earth, and also strong infrared aurora, which you can't see. Um, now, the, the UV images I just showed are the, the prettiest set, uh, so just focus on those. But the, the hydrogen spectrum of uh, Saturn's aurora contains all of these different elements. Uh, the problem is that in images from, like, from Cassini, for example, which is, this, this is an image of Saturn's pole, this interesting hexagon thing here, um, the reflected light from the sun makes it actually difficult to actually observe the optical aurora directly. Um, so there isn't a really good image of it, uh, but uh, this is a really awesome image. <laughs> uh, but um, it has been seen directly on its night side. Um, so Saturn, uh, Cassini goes, 
onto Saturn's night side and observes the pole and actually has a strong detection of the optical aurora. Um, but there's not a good like uh, image of it exactly. All right. <coughs> now Jupiter is actually very similar to Saturn. The composition of the uh, atmosphere is very much the same. So it's going to have the exact same set of aurorae, um, UV, optical red, optical red, and infrared. But uh, Jupiter is also very interesting because it has an intrinsic internal auroral system that's actually independent of the solar wind. So we're going to discuss that in a moment. But I also wanted to point out that a recent missions to, to Jupiter, uh, Galileo, which was there maybe 15 years ago, and uh, now Juno, which will be arriving at Jupiter this summer, will have been you know, important uh, for learning about Jupiter, and especially its moons. Uh, Galileo did a really, really great job of that. Um, but Juno is actually designed explicitly to learn more about the uh, polar regions of Jupiter. So they actually give us important information on what the aurora are like and uh, solve some outstanding questions with regards to the uh, physics underlying these aurorae. So one thing I want to point out is that the Jovian aurora is the strongest in the solar system. Uh, so I want to show this uh, NASA JPL travel poster, uh, which you can download for free and uh, have yourself uh, ex go and experience the mighty auroras of Jupiter. Uh, this is actually my favorite of the posters. Um, I don't think they quite look like this, but it's, it's a nice visualization. <laughs> Uh, so what, what, do, what, do, what do Jupiter's orbit actually look like? Um, so here I'm showing uh, is Jupiter, I zoom in, a sort of highlight of the polar region, and then I zoom in in the UV. See the main auroral oval, uh, much like we've seen before, um, and there's the stuff filling in the middle, and then it actually has this spot here in this trail, uh, which is interesting. Uh, so that, what's actually going on here? So <clears throat> There are multiple different mechanisms taking place within the Jovian magnetospheric system, so the region where its magnetic field is dominant. Um, <clears throat> the middle regions here are the parts of the Jovian you know, polar uh, auroral oval that is determined or modulated by the solar wind. That's the stuff in here. Uh, the main oval corresponds to the intrinsic uh, current system, which I'll discuss in a little bit. And there's these spots. Um, so these spots correspond to uh, Jupiter's moons, uh, Io, Ganymede, and Europa. Uh, <clears throat> so the way these spots work is that uh, within the Jovian ma magnetic field, uh, you have the uh, planets orbiting. So here's Io. And the way it works is that there's actually a magnetic tube connecting the moon to uh, the planet itself. That's what this uh, tube here is. And along the uh, orbit of the moon and this magnetic tube, the electrons get accelerated along the tube and are driven into the atmosphere. And it creates the, the spot uh, I showed before. And that's actually the case for each of these other outer moons. However, Io's is the strongest, which is why it's the brightest. Uh, now, the interesting thing about uh, Io and Jupiter is that Io uh, also hosts um, extreme volcanism. So it's constantly spurting all sorts of stuff. And the plasma that comes out of it, uh, these molecules, end up forming this torus here. That's what this green is. Uh, and it, it loads, uh, it fills the uh, Jovian magnetic region um, with this plasma, which is actually really crucial for um, the next mechanism, which is um, the intrinsic... Uh, main oval. We already discussed the, the solar wind modulator before. Um, so the way this main uh, roll oval takes place is, is a consequence of these current systems in the magnetosphere. So this is magnetic region. Um, this plasma disk is rotating and it establishes these stable and strong currents. And that's what accelerates the electrons. So then those are driven along these field lines into uh, the atmosphere. And that's what d determines the shape of the, and the strength of the main auroral oval uh, for Jupiter. But, you know, th this is sort of a schematic view, and, and 
there's still some questions to be solved exactly how this happens, um, you know, what's actually happening in this acceleration region, uh, and the Juno mission is designed to answer a lot of these questions. Um, so I'm actually looking forward to the results from that coming uh, over summer and uh, into next year. So the last thing I want to touch upon, which is not necessarily in the solar system, but the prospect for exoplanetary orbiting. I'm sure you've all heard that uh, there are many, many exoplanets out there that have been discovered. Um, and because we know that these same physical processes that are taking place in the solar system should be applicable to other uh, regions of the galaxy and these other systems, um, this is just an artist's impression, we expect there to be the same kinds of auroral physics taking place in these other systems. Uh, although we might not yet be able to detect uh, extraplanetary aurorae in the visible uh, ultraviolet um, uh, wavelengths, there's actually a radio component to uh, these processes, which um, are currently being looked at by people working uh, at Caltech uh, students. So I'm looking forward to them potentially finding something. Um, <clears throat> but it hasn't happened yet. But, they, but it, they, they're, they're, they're hot on the trail, I'd say. <clears throat> so just sort of wrap up. Um, now, in the solar system, we have these physical mechanisms that take place throughout solar system. Uh, it's definitely a consequence of energetic particles impacting the planetary atmosphere. And, these and the colors that we see are determined by the kinds of gases that are there and the composition, relative composition of within the atmosphere and where they're, they're taking place. Um, and also importantly, the, uh, the distribution of those emissions and the lights on the planet itself depends strongly on what the magnetic environment is. You know, what's the configuration of the magnetic field on, on the planet? You know, the Earth versus Mars cases are very different and uh, lead to uh, potentially very different uh, observations of what's actually going on. So I can stop there and take questions. Thank you. Over there. Probably. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe there is not. Um, I think the, one of the big differences is the amount of uh, ambient plasma that's available. So in the uh, Jovian case, uh, Io actually you know, produces a lot of the stuff, and then it can actually uh, make that connection. Um, and Jupiter's magnetic field is much stronger. Um, so the moon in our uh, magnetic region doesn't in interact in the same way. Um, So, <clears throat> what it, it, it's sort of actually a, it's, it's, a, it's a susceptibly simple question, but it's actually really like difficult to say. It's like, what is a magnetic field? Um, uh, so, one way to think about it is that um, we know that there are electric charges, let's say and that produces electric fields. And the field is our conceptualization of the forces that this uh, particle can interact with other things. Um, but we also know that things can move, and physics is always the same, which is the principle of relativity, um, in Einstein's sense. So in these other frames, uh, the magnetic field is uh, equivalent to the electric field in a different moving frame. So this is... So one way to think about it is that magnetic fields are really just electric fields from uh, another vantage point. Um, but constantly things are moving. So uh, that's one way to think about it. Uh, another way to think about it is that magnetic fields are also the consequence of moving charges. Um, so when charges move, the magnetic field is something that is produced, which you can measure directly as a impact of, um, or you can feel, you can measure the effects that these uh, magnetic fields have on other things. So it's like they exist 
and you can measure them. Um, I'm not sure that helps. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Very good. So it, it used to have a magnetic field and has since decayed. Um, but it's, so it's like very, it's, mu it's much weak, it's much weaker than it used to be, um, and it doesn't have the same uh, global pattern that we see on the Earth. That's also true. Um, but it, it doesn't have the same global pattern, so it, it doesn't have the protective, it doesn't provide the protective shield to Mars that uh, the, our, our magnetic field applies to the Earth. Very good. So, um, Pluto is actually really interesting because we're actually only learning uh, more about Pluto now from New Horizons, uh, which is there. Um, and you know, it's produced a lot of uh, really great surprises. For example, the Pluto at Pluto's atmosphere has been um, only really recently really uh, figured out what it really how, how thick it is. Um, so the problem with Pluto is that it doesn't really have the same intrinsic mechanisms that happen on Jupiter, and because it's so far away, the solar wind is really weak. So that the kind of particles that are reaching Pluto from the sun are, aren't energetic enough to really produce the same kind of um, visible auroral emissions that we see here. Uh, so it's really weak. Um, and then it's not, it can't, doesn't have the mechanisms that can produce it on its own. So not really. Yes, so that's what we believe is happening. So for the Earth, the magnetic field is generated by um, the metallic liquid that's in the core of the Earth, which is moving, and that generates the global magnetic field pattern. What we think is happening on Mars is that uh, they used to have that mechanism, but it has since cooled off and is no longer moving in the same way. So there used to be a magnetic field there, but it has decayed because the core has cooled. Um, so that's what we believe is happening. Go the far back. That's a good question. So uh, the sun also has a really large magnetic field. Um, and the solar wind carries uh, a lot of these energetic particles to uh, the Earth's magnetic field. And <clears throat> so because it's uh, also magnetized, what's happening is that the sun's magnetic field lines are merging with the Earth's magnetic field lines. And when they're stronger, that balance um, is no longer, so the, the region that we showed is the region of the, around the Earth in which the Earth's magnetic field is dominant. So what happens is that the sun's solar wind, which is also magnetized, becomes stronger, and then the region in which the Earth's magnetic field is dominant shrinks. Let's go over there. Um, not exactly. So, uh, where, like, the, like the size of the ring, is that what you're referring to? So, in, if you imagine, <clears throat> so in, in a sense, yes. The actual region that encompasses that oval is larger on a larger planet like Jupiter. So like that region, um, that whole oval region is, is way bigger than like the Earth. Um, but the region itself is really defined by, you can also see, but you can say that in, in a different way that it might be potentially the same in terms of the opening angle. So the angles might be similar, but the actual physical extent of the region is determined by the planet's size and radius. So yes, over here. Um, <clears throat> so this is slightly outside of um, what I know, but uh, yes. So one one uh, example for is that uh, we know the Earth's interior has a lot of radioactive 
elements, which helps heat up the internal uh, structure of the, of the planet. Um, if the Martian composition is, is different internally, then that's going to lead to a different amount of heating within the atmosphere, within the uh, like mantle of Mars, let's say. Um, so that could be an effect. Um, and also, because Mars is smaller, I may not, ha may not have had as much internal heat to dissipate. Right. But you know, the composition may uh, change the heat, heating. Yeah. Uh, everybody else? Okay. Uh, right there. Um, so I didn't want to go too much into that, um, but I mentioned uh, how uh, Io is is erupting and uh, sending out all these uh, things into the into the Jovian magnetosphere. So what happens is all that uh, plasma is. Uh, collapses into, into a disk in this rotating magnetic field. And then that disk also uh, moves radially away. So then that's, that's what uh, I showed in the graphic there. Um, it, uh, right, so it's it generated here and then it moves radially out. Um, <clears throat> so it's the plasma just ionized uh, stuff. So protons, uh, elementary particles. Um, so how it actually generates these current systems um, has to do with uh, some mechanism that's known as rotation breakdown. Um, it's a little tricky, but the idea is that um, the disk that's rotating can no longer keep up with the rotating magnetic field, and that uh, creates a, a large, strong electric field along the edge where it, it sort of starts to slip, um, and that slippage and the electric field is what accelerates these electrons, and the electrons follow the magnetic field lines, because the and the current uh, is generated along the magnetic field lines. Um, sort of the rough idea. Uh, please thank our, our speaker. Please thank our speaker. All right, those of you who've stuck around. Uh, can people hear me? Oh, okay. Yeah. So those of you who have stuck around are potentially interested in having questions answered about the field of astrophysics or, or related fields? Or, yeah, you just enjoy the, the seats, the nice uh, environment here. Uh, so, you know, this is pretty free form. I've, I've, I've put together kind of a, a, a slideshow, if, if you guys run out of questions, on uh, some of the images of the things that you can see outside. but through like really good telescopes instead of the telescopes that we have, which are fine. They're just not like the Keck telescopes that are enormous billion dollar instruments. Those are a thousand dollar instruments instead. So, so we have some of those images that I put together into a slideshow or I figured we'd just start out and have people ask general questions that they might have. So do you guys have general questions? Pappy. Solar storms. solar storms. How are solar storms created? Sure. Who wants to talk about convection? <laughs> well, I'll explain it more simply than that. Um, well, first, first thing to realize is that the sun might look like this just orange ball in the sky. You don't see a lot of the stuff that's going on on the surface. Uh, the, sun, the sun's magnetic field and its surface is very active, there's a lot of stuff happening, and of course it's really hot. And um, because uh, it's hot, that there's a lot of ionized particles, and when ionized particles and magnetic fields come together, stuff happens. So that's pretty much what it is, and sometimes when the magnetic field um, is connected to the surface, and the surface of the sun rotates at different speeds, like the pole is faster than the equator, so parts of the uh, magnetic field that are connected to the surface are being pulled uh, at different speeds. So you, all of this magnetic field gets really distorted to the point that it finally breaks and reconnects on the surface and then you make all these flares and then when it disconnects from the surface you just make this coronal mass ejection that just then travels through yeah, the flares out. And that activity is also um, has to do with the solar cycle and the solar cycle is on an average about 11 years 
um, but how high the activity level also changes like not each um, not each cycle is as active as the last one you have some very active cycles and some not so active cycles and how to know that the sun is like at the peak of its activity has to do with the number of uh, sunspots you see and the more the sunspots the more active the sun is uh, so yeah, so that's that's what causes uh, the solar flares. Um, and um, by the time a coronal mass ejection or anything comes to say the Earth, the, the particles are traveling at about 400 kilometers per second. So you can imagine that's really high speed. And when it hits the Earth, you yeah, you at least the upper atmosphere is feel it. Oh, well, which part? Um, <laughs> So the, the corona is like a million degrees Celsius. It's, uh, the, that's, the, not the, uh, the, that's the atmosphere above the sun. You don't even see it. Uh, the surface is about 6,000 Kelvin, uh, so about 6,000 degrees Celsius. Oh. Oh, yeah. So you <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my name is Swarnam Manohar. Uh, to be doctor after I get two more signatures. So, uh, yay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gina Dugan. Um, I'm a grad student here. Uh, not near the end, near the middle about. Um, I'm Abby Kreitz. I'm a postdoc here at Caltech and I build cameras. Um, I'm the one that's speaking in a month, so you should come back. <laughs> I build cameras at the South Pole and other places. <laughs> uh, my name is Drew Claussen. I'm also a postdoc here and I uh, try to study uh, how we can observe uh, black holes in the universe. Um, okay, so you're asking why the pole speed of, uh, of the surface of the sun is faster than the equatorial speed. Um, that's because, uh, first of all, it's not a solid. So it's not rotating as a rigid body as like the Earth does because it's mostly gas, especially in the atmosphere and like the surface. This, um, it, it just there's, it doesn't rotate as a rigid body. So uh, because the sun is spinning as a, as a sphere, the pole become faster than. So the, I think at the equator uh, it's um, 33 days, and then at the poles is about 25 to 28 days, and of course that changes too. Um, uh, to get to the Jupiter. Okay, um, to get, okay, so. Like if you were to, to send a, a ship to get there or the light that, that we're seeing that's coming from there? Uh, With conventional stuff? Uh, um, okay, I can sort of answer that. Uh, so it really depends on how you make your ship. You can get there fast uh, within uh, five years, but you can also get there slow. It de depends on how you make your orbit. Uh, from Earth, like if you just put in conventional fuels, that will take time, but most of the time what uh, um, scientists or engineers do here is you, you use other planets to increase the speed. It's called a gravity assist. Uh, that's how most of the other, uh, like Voyager and Pioneer, that's how they've gotten to the very edge of the solar system is because you use gravity assists uh, from, you basically steal a very small amount of speed from a planet to jumpstart your... Uh, what's the advantage of making fuel that's going to cut down the time eventually to get to Jupiter and other planets? Uh, well, I mean, that's actually a really great question, and one of the things that's kind of happening right now is people are kind of brainstorming new ideas. So one of them is kind of to use like a giant solar sail, so you actually use the radiation pressure from the sun on a big sail to go really fast. But I mean, all of these, all of these new technologies have kind of, I guess, different downsides. So I think it's actually a really hard problem. Like if people are interested in science, like that's something that we should be working on in like the next decades to actually start moving faster because we don't actually have a way to, so Voyager spacecraft is like one of the farthest spacecrafts that's gone. It's like at the edge of our solar system, I guess they say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, even if we were to leave today, we wouldn't actually, we don't have technology that's that much better than that to get out there right now. And that was from 1977. Yeah. yeah, so for example, the Galileo spacecraft took six years to get to Jupiter. 
Um, but that was launched in 1989. Um, so that's when I was born. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, and another problem is the faster you go, then you have to slow down once you get there. And so that takes fuel and energy. So, so just getting super fast isn't, isn't all you need. Radio isotopes? Isotopes. I, chemical isotopes? I, I don't know what they are. I heard it over at JPL. Oh. Uh, uh, as, a, as a fuel source? Yeah, there's some reports that are replacing it because of solar and the sun mm -hmm. is out of range, but radio isotopes don't need the sun. They just use it as a power source. Like maybe. So, uh, when you're referring to radioisotopes, in general, when they put spacecrafts at long, large distances from us, they need some sort of energy source, right? Yeah. And so they've used radioisotopes, which are like uh, plutonium or uh, uranium, radiati radiating isotopes of heavy elements like that, that are constantly shooting out electrons and ions that can be collected and turned into a battery. And the nice thing about that is that you have this basically infinite battery source, not infinite in terms of energy that's put out, but it's just constantly ticking away, sending out radiation that they can collect and turn into a battery. The problem, of course, is that plutonium is not good for humans or life sources because it is shooting out radiation. So there's a concern. In fact, how many of you here have seen The Martian? Okay. Well, in The Martian, uh, uh, Watney collects uh, a radioisotope on the surface of Mars that's buried. Uh, I, I hope I'm not ruining anything here. Um, uh, it's not a major plot point, but he, 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 he takes it out of the ground where it was buried to not be disturbed because it's, a, it's emitting radiation in the same way that uh, you wouldn't want to be close to a big source of uranium or plutonium because you'd get cancer over time. But um, so those are, so long story short, those are dangerous to have on ships because if there's uh, an explosion as it launches, you dump a bunch of radiation all over the yeah. eastern seaboard. Uh, but trying to move towards more green things like solar energy in terms of collecting the, the solar radiation and turning that into a battery is much more uh, responsible and you're not going to explode radiation all over the Atlantic Ocean and such. So there's, there's more of a move towards that. But that also does have a drawback in that the satellite that recently landed on the comet ended up falling into a crevice so that it was blocked from the sun's rays and so then it lost energy. So, so I mean, so you see both sides of why it's a debate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is true that there's a, a black hole at the center of the Milky Way, and as far as we know, there is a big, giant black hole that we call a supermassive black hole that's sitting at the center of every galaxy that we see in the universe, just about. Um, the, the black hole that's the, the center of our galaxy weighs three million times as much as the sun. So it's this huge black hole that's you know, three million times the mass of the sun. Um, and it is uh, what we call a dormant black hole. Um, there's some black holes that live at the centers of galaxies that are surrounded by this huge reservoir of gas. And as that gas falls onto the black hole, it gets very, very hot and it can glow very bright. It can glow so bright that it, it shines in x-rays. And this is one of the ways that we can study those distant black holes. Uh, but the one that's sitting at the center of our galaxy is actually, it kind of doesn't have anything to munch on. There's no gas around there that's falling into the black hole. So the way that we mostly study that black hole is we can actually see stars, uh, individual stars that are, that are making orbits around that black hole just like, you know, the Earth orbits around the Sun. And so black holes, uh, you know, they don't, there's this conception that they, they suck everything in. Um, but the gravity that a black hole has is the same kind of gravity that, you know, the Sun or the Earth has. And so you're not going to, unless you're, unless you're aimed right at the black hole, you won't fall into it. You'll actually just go into a nice orbit around it just like the Earth orbits around the Sun. So 
Right, so yeah, it's gas, because by the time it gets really close to the black hole, everything has become so hot that, you know, you've gone from a solid that you've evaporated into a gas, and that gas is so hot that it's turned into this plasma. Plasma, we've been saying that word a lot. That's just, you know, kind of the next thing above a gas, where instead of just, you know, having all the atoms being individualized, you, you actually pull the, all the electrons off the atoms, so all of the, you know, subatomic particles are just freely floating around there. And that really hot material is what emits these x-rays that we see as it's falling onto the black hole. Right, yeah, I know, it's all, I mean, so a lot of, almost all of the, the gas and all of the different places that we look in the universe is, is, has a very similar composition. It's made mostly of hydrogen, uh, you know, maybe about 70, 75 percent. 20 to 25 percent is made out of helium. And then just the last kind of 2 percent is, you know, all of the stuff that we think is what most of the, the Earth is made of, you know. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of that going around out in the universe, and then there's, there's places where that that kind of pristine gas is, is collapsing and forming stars. And one of those places is the Orion Nebula, which they can see tonight, is that right? Yeah, they're, they're looking at the Orion Nebula. Yeah. Uh, did you, you can see the Orion Nebula. What's that? What's the question? Is that the next, the next thing right open about? Yeah, so the, the Orion... Sorry. Oh, no problem. Ooh, I can draw it on the chalk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here's Orion. something like this. These are the, this is Betelgeuse. Okay. It's red. It's pretty identifiable as a red star. Uh, whereas most stars you just look up and you see they're whitish. But this one is very identifiable. So that's Betelgeuse. Um, this is Rigel down here. So that's a supermassive like red giant, uh, super, uh, a red supergiant. This is like a blue supergiant. And then this is the belt. This is usually the most identifying feature of Orion. And then this is kind of the, the sword or the the uh, knife that's hanging from the belt. The Orion Nebula is right in the it's, the, it's the middle star. It's not really a star, but when you just look up in the sky, you see three dots. It looks like a star because it's pretty compact. But in deep images, you can actually see it's a very extended structure. And it consists of a lot of plasma and uh, hot gas because it's a nursery for stars. And there's a whole collection of small stars forming in that structure. Not quite. So the black hole, I mean, although that seems like it's a huge thing that weighs three million times the mass of the sun, that's actually a really small amount of the total mass of our galaxy. And so the black hole only dominates the orbits of the stars uh, that are very, very close to it within, you know, a few hundred light years or something like that. Um, most of the stars in our galaxy are orbiting around just the collection of all of the mass of the stars. So, you know, there's some point where you have, if you, you, you can find like the center of mass of the galaxy, just like, you know, you have a center of gravity in your body. And all of the stars are kind of orbiting around that point, um, which, which coincides pretty closely to where the black hole is. But it's actually not, the black hole is not the, the source of most of this gravitational uh, force. Yeah, but you could also think of, like, the, the bulge, you know, the collection of all the, the stars and the black hole, like, in the center. Like, you know, you do see especially in disk galaxies, the idea of a disk going around the center. But like as you said, the center isn't quite the black hole because that's a relatively small portion of everything. But, but you do see the similar kind of view and it is, you know, obviously a bunch of, a collection of things all moving around due to gravity. I should also mention that galaxies are, are not symmetrical at all. Um, like my PhD thesis was about two merging galaxies and there's no center point. Like you have no idea where the gas is, what it's uh, going around or what's happening. So it's galaxies are more a collection of stars than having a specific shape. Milky Way has a spiral shape but you have lo lots of different shapes that 
occur and that um, and it's very irregular there's the velocities are not like standard or, uh, or you know following any rhyme or rhythm so it's difficult to say that you can't really say that yeah it's going around the black hole <laughs> it's not a coincidence because because the black hole, although it's not you know as massive as the entire galaxy, it is the most massive single object in the galaxy. And so, if you were to like uh, Swarnam said, you know, there's galaxies that merge, and so those each of those galaxies has one of these big black holes in it. And after those galaxies merge, interactions between that, those two black holes and all the other stars will kind of slowly cause the black hole to sink down into the center of this new combined galaxy. So the black holes sink towards the centers uh, because they are the most massive single object. So, uh, yes. Um, so I don't know for our specific galaxy, I'm sure it has to occur. Recently? Oh. Yes, I was going to mention there's tidal disruption events, which uh, here at Caltech we have the Palomar Transient Factory, which is a survey, and so it's looking for anything that changes like night to night, and so I'm writing a paper right now about a star that fell into a black hole. And where did it go? Where'd it go? went into it. So, so when, when a star goes close enough to a black hole and the trajectory is just such so that it actually is going to get into the black hole, it, the, the force, the gravitational force of the black hole rips apart the star. So the, the force of the black hole is stronger than the force of the star holding it together because you are close enough. And so it rips it apart and, and it falls into, it forms a disk and then gets, falls into the black hole. And so we see an emission from that. We see light coming out of that. And so, so yeah, so there are many documented cases of, of single stars falling in. In addition to, you know, what Drew was saying, you know, if there's a bunch of gas around it, then we see these active galactic nuclei, they're called, you see these black holes that are constantly spewing out emission from stuff being accreted. But if it's, if it's a, quiet, a quiet black hole, you'll see a bump in emission when a single star falls in. And so that's really exciting because you can probe different things about the black hole and its effects. And I should mention, like, just a month and a half ago, two black holes fell into each other, uh, which was, uh, it came out, it, it, we have an observatory called LIGO, uh, which measures gravitational waves. And when two black holes fall into each other, basically merge, it creates an explosion that we can't see by our, in our eyes, through our eyes, but you can see it in the gravitational wave uh, the gravitational field of the universe, and that's what we, uh, we saw. How far was this? Um, the two black holes, was it a uh, 1.3 billion light years away? Yeah, so it was 1.3 billion light years away. So that gravitational field took, uh, that explosion took 1.3 billion light, year, uh, uh, light years to get to us. So it's happened, and it's one black hole now, and it's all happened happy somewhere else in the universe, but we are only just seeing it. That was pretty cool. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah. Which is like so exciting that we're able to detect it so far. It's just like astonishing. Yeah. So it was like was so happy that I was yeah. here at Caltech when this happened. Yeah, so it's already heard of that in the news. Yeah. It was a Newton's law or something. It was, I mean, Einstein's gravitational, like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah a couple of weeks. Yeah, a question. So if you get a star that's super, that's very, very large, so you start with a very, very large star, and so it goes through its evolution, and it gets to the point where in, in like our sun, you have the pressure from, uh, from fusion and from, from different things compacting the pull of gravity, so it's a stable 
you know, ball of mm -hmm. plasma, as we like to say. But, it, but if, the, if the star is so massive, that pressure is not enough to combat the pull of its gravity. And so then it coalesces into a black hole. And so that would be a rather small, you know, stellar massive black hole. Um, and then getting up to a supermassive black hole, if it keeps accreting stuff, or merges with other things, then it can get even larger. But do you have a more detailed explanation? No, I mean, I think the, the idea of black holes goes back a long way, much longer than kind of, you know, how long we've understood that stars will evolve during their lives and produce black holes. But it was just, it was actually thought about, uh, you know, almost 400 years ago. Somebody, you know, this is when Newton taught us how gravity works. You know, the Earth has some gravity that kind of holds you to it. And if you throw something up in the air, the gravity is going to make it fall back down. But you know from rockets and things like that, eventually you can launch something up with such a high velocity that will, it will escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. And so somebody just started thinking, you know, what if there was ever an object where the gravity was so strong that not even light, the thing that moves the fastest of anything in the universe, could escape from the surface of this object? And so just by kind of doing this mental thought experiment, uh, he came up with this idea that if you had enough mass in a small enough volume, eventually the gravitational force from that object would be so strong that nothing, not even light, which moves, at, you know, that's the, the speed of light is the speed limit for the universe, <laughs> like not even that could escape from the, the surface of this object. And so that's what a black hole is. And so for a long time it was just this kind of theoretical construct of, you know, some guy dreamt up this crazy idea that you could have this thing that had such strong gravity that not even light could escape. But eventually we learned that when stars in their lives, they can actually leave behind these extremely dense objects that we know as black holes. Thank you. Yeah, uh, So I'm not an expert on this, but what I think, so, um, so that is a really interesting point. And so I remember from my particle physics class that they were talking about a similar thing about, you know, how there's quarks and anti-quarks and that it was like, it was uh, unusual that there are more quarks than anti because they could anni self-annihilate and which did happen. And there was a point where this occurred and we had leftovers. And so the fact that we had leftover quarks at all is kind of, to my knowledge, a mystery. I mean, I'm sure that they have explanations of it that I don't know. Um, and so I think that in a similar way, I think this is also something that has been discussed on why is it even, like there's not an intrinsic reason that I know of of why it's required that it's even. Um, and I think that it's something that they build into their models is one of their prerequisites that in order to make the world that we see, we have to have, you know, more electrons than positrons and we have to have, you know, relatively even, a, you know, positive charge and negative charge, charge things. But I think that you should definitely look more into that. And there are people here at Caltech that know the answer. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. I think that um, there's a lot of people looking for, for planets like Earth around other stars elsewhere, even, uh, you know, in, in our galaxy, and, you know, there's no reason why they wouldn't be in other galaxies. Well, we, haven't, we haven't found one yet, but I'm just talking mm -hmm. about the event itself. The yeah. Big Bang. Oh, well, the Big Bang happened for everything. So there's one Big Bang for the whole, whole universe. And so that just happened once and affected everything. But there's our solar system, which, you know, we have our star, and then the planets formed around that, our sun. And so the, the creation of planets like Earth absolutely are happening in other places. I don't know if I... Well, fortunately for us, we live really, really far away from that black hole. So we live something like 50,000 light years away from that black hole. So we have no danger of falling in ever. Um, if it were to become active, uh, you know, it, it, would be, it might become a very bright object in the sky, but it, it would probably just be something that we could look at you know, with our telescopes from afar. It wouldn't affect your day-to-day -day life much probably. So, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> so, so, yeah, dark matter is, uh, do you want to talk to you? I'll study galaxies, don't you? <laughs> okay, well, I can answer. Okay, so, so dark matter uh, interacts with any other matter, stars, black holes, through gravitational pull. Uh, so, so it would act, interact with that as much as, as anything else. But, um, but the thing about dark matter is, so galaxies have a, a dark matter halo, and it's just called dark. Unlike dark energy, they're actually quite distinct, both mysterious. But dark matter is called dark because we don't see emission from it. It doesn't, you know, physically inter, you know, bump into particles and throw off energy that we see as light. It, as far, you know, oversimplification, perhaps, is that it just interacts through gravity. And there's, you know, particle physicists and people here are, think, are working very hard to find out exactly how much, maybe it weakly interacts with things in some ways. But so mainly it interacts just through gravity, is the, my short answer. Yeah, you've given that analogy of the uh, black hole, how nothing can escape, or light can escape. There's a recent movie called Interstellar where they talk about how time kind of slows down. Well, so the nice thing about Einstein's theory is it's, it's called relativity because everything is relative. And so for an observer outside of the black hole, when someone or something passes through this, this point of no return, the surface of the black hole, where not even light can escape, to an outside observer, it looks like time freezes for that person as they cross into the black hole. But for the person who fell into the black hole, time still continues for them just the same as it ever has. They don't they perceive a second just the same way you ever they ever perceived a second. Um, it's kind of like in the interstellar movie, when they go down to the planet, they think it's been you know, 15 minutes, but they get back up and it's been 30 years for the guy who was waiting in the spacecraft. And it's the exact same thing when you go through the black hole. So for an outside observer, it looks like time stops at the, what we call the event horizon, the edge of the black hole. But for somebody who falls into the black hole, you know, they, they don't realize time has stopped. It's, time is just ticking away normally for them, and uh, eventually what they're going to do is fall right into the center of the black hole. But we don't, physics, the physics we understand doesn't work inside of a black hole, so nobody really knows what happens once you get in there. But time, for you, you will feel like time is just passing the same way. Yeah, I've helped with telescopes. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I ground a mirror. I was, I was in middle school. My father is an amateur astronomer, and he builds telescopes all the time. So to make him happy, I did it. And then <laughs> here I am. So it clearly worked out well. Um, <laughs> yeah. What size and what do you Oh, yeah, it was, it was really great. Um, at the time, I was a little less enthusiastic about it. But, um, but yeah, so it's really, really fun. I think it was really worthwhile. It's amazing seeing, you know, planets through something that you made. And I think it, like, helps conceptualize it really well. And I think it's worthwhile. Um, I don't know if you want to do the whole grinding the mirror thing. I mean, you can. And I did. Um, and so that's, you know, that's fine, too. You just, um, you know, get a piece of glass, and then you put a pitch, actually, which is this, it's technically a liquid, but it's like so slowly moving. It seems like a solid and you just rub, you just polish it essentially. So you put grit with water and spray it and then just rub it. So I would watch chick flicks while doing it. And you know, you just watch your movie and you slurp your little thing back and forth and move it to polish it. And then you send it out to get aluminized. And then you have your mirror. And, and then you can, uh, on, online there's diagrams for making telescopes, but so you just need like a, I think my mirror was like three inches. So just like a, s yeah, yep, with a refracting telescope. And so mine was quite long so that you can, so it's a little more forgiving if it has a higher F number. And, and yeah, and it's, it's really fun. I mean, my, my dad would build uh, mounts out of soap buckets that you buy, like from Costco, you get these big plastic, plastic buckets and you just fill it up with uh, foam. And I think actually he has a, a plan for it online if you want to make it, but you don't have to. <laughs> um, but I think it's really worthwhile. How long did it take you grinding the mirror? Um, gr <laughs> grinding the mirror took a while. Um, I think it was about, I vaguely remember, this was a while ago, uh, like a month of doing like one one movie a night, so. But <laughs> you can buy a mirror. <laughs> That's not right. So. I just want to thank you guys. We're going to take off. Well, thank you very much. Oh yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, so um, my dad also wanted me to be a scientist, <laughs> and I am. <laughs> um, and I love it. <laughs> He's always right. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, so I build telescopes for my job. So they're actually different telescopes from the kind of telescopes that Gina built uh, at her house because uh, the telescopes that we build are actually for light that your eyes can't see. So it's a different wavelength of light. So instead of being in that visible spectrum that was shown during the talk, it's actually really long wavelengths of light. And it's closer to something that like a radio antenna or a TV antenna can pick up. And we're actually looking at really, really faint signals from the Big Bang that emits that radiation, of, that wavelength of radiation. So because you can't actually buy a telescope like that because people don't need them to do other things like take pictures of their cats, um, <laughs> you actually have to make the telescope. So what we do is we make the detectors and they're actually kind of, they're a lot bigger because the wavelength of light is smaller. So instead of having like uh, 10 million pixels in the CCD like you do in your digital camera. You have like a thousand pixels in a camera that's about this big. And then the whole camera itself actually ends up being like as big as this table. So it's, a, so it's the same equivalent to like your digital camera except for different wavelengths of light and it's much bigger because the light wavelength is longer. And then we end up putting it on a big aluminum dish that's kind of, so we don't have to use glass because uh, the wavelength is also longer so it's a bit more forgiving in that way. So you have a bunch of dishes that look like kind of giant TV dishes. So that's what I do. Oh yeah. Uh, how much more role is it the uh, validity to build an observatory to start? Yeah. Well, we're lucky that there's already an Antarctic base down there. So there's a lot of infrastructure already because people are doing a lot of science experiments down there. Um, but it is kind of politically difficult in that you have to write a grant to the National Science Foundation, which is one of the government agencies that uh, fund science in the U.S. And you have to kind of show that you're building a worthwhile telescope, then, you know, it costs a lot of money. So, yeah, I mean, it's pretty difficult. Not that many people are doing it, probably for that reason. But, I mean, if the Russians and everybody else want to do one, is there a body that controls, like, well, how many there are going to be, and because everybody wants to do one? That I 
really don't know, actually. Yeah. There is an agreement from uh, a couple of countries who have had who have stations there. There are only a few countries who have stations there, and they have kind of divi divided a little bit of land around those stations that they established there. So, from what I understand, there are. Um, six, I want to say, uh, and there, of course you also need agreements from countries from where you have to take off because of course it's not easy to get to the Antarctic, so uh, New Zealand is one place you can go from and uh, Chile and um, Argentina are two other places you can go from, so it's, you have to have agreements from there, there too. Uh, and uh, of course it's like um, Antarctic is like, uh, it comes under international maritime laws also, so yeah, if, there, if a crime happens there, I don't even know how they're going to prosecute that. It's, it's a big issue, and I think they have been trying to solve that for some time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so first of all, so what happens to you in a black hole? Um, I'll give that question to him in a bit, but <laughs> from what I understand, and this is very simplistic, uh, you have to understand the, the gravitational force is immense. So the gravity you feel at your feet is going to be different from what you fe uh, feel at your head. So you're basically going to be ribbed apart. It, it's <laughs> it's going to be painful. I don't even know if you're going to be able to feel the pain. There's a, there's a term called spaghettification. <laughs> it describes it because you get stretched out like spaghetti noodles. Because it, whenever you're in a gravitational field, the, the part of you that's closer to that gravitational mass, like for instance on the surface of the Earth, my feet are getting pulled down slightly more than my head is. But it's very slight, and so you don't really feel the effect, and you're, the, the molecules in your body are holding you together and they counteract that, that differential in force. But on, on, in a black hole or another strong gravitational field like a neutron star, you would be, you'd be stretched and spaghettified. But there's actually an interesting thing about that. So if, if you're going to fall into a black hole that is kind of like similar in mass to our sun, then this is exactly right. You'll be stretched out into this long string. But this really huge black hole that sits at the center of our galaxy, you can actually fall into that one without even noticing it. Um, because the strength of this force that stretches you out is kind of, it's kind of a tricky thing, but it actually depends kind of inversely, kind of one over the mass of the black hole. So the more mass of the black hole is, the, the weaker this stretching of you becomes. And so, uh, like Gina said, the, these big black holes will rip apart whole stars, but because you're so much smaller than the star, you can actually just fall whole into the, the big black hole. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you should be able to see all four of the Galilean moons. Uh, did, okay. Were you guys yeah. able to see? Yeah. Did you see all four? Yeah. 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 And Sebastian was saying that it has the island of volcanoes, mm -hmm. right? So it does, it does have a core on its own? A core? Yeah. 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 yeah, so Io is so close in to, to Jupiter in its orbit, so the, the moons are. I don't know how, how they were, how you saw them in projection tonight, but there's something like this, or not next to Orion. This is, uh, this is, this is something else entirely. So you've got Jupiter, here's its dot, you know. Um, and the moons are all orbiting in the same plane. And uh, Io tends to be the one that's closest of the four uh, that, that's in its orbit, and it's so close. The closer it is, it's like we were talking about with black holes, um, the closer you are to this massive structure, the more gravitational pull it has. And the more you, you feel the effects of its gravitation in the form of, it's, it's called tidal fields. It's responsible, like our tides on the Earth are caused by the gravitational pull of the moon and of the sun. But um, the tidal fields are so strong on Io that they're, they're pulling and, and pushing it and, 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 and changing its shape from a perfect sphere it, it's, it's kind of ripping it up. I mean, it's not tearing it up, but it's, but it's, it's pulling and pushing on it, and that's causing a lot of active uh, geological forces interior and, and causing eruption of, of, of volcanoes. I think they're like sulfur volcanoes or something like that. And, and with that comes the ejection of material and, and the generation of plasma that's causing a lot of uh, magnetic activity that's funneling back, and, and that's why you saw that, that aurora spot um, on the on the polar regions from that 
that like flux tube that he was describing. It's really, I didn't know about that. That was pretty interesting. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so it does have a Yeah, there's, there's stuff going on inside because it's being stretched. Let's see. Okay, so the Hubble telescope. Um, well, so, so scientists have been using it for, for many things. It's still actively used because it's a really great imaging. It's a great uh, photography with this satellite. And so, so uh, every you know, six months, scientists will put in requests of something that they want in the sky. They want a really, really good image of it. And so there's a lot of things that, are that our atmosphere really gets in the way. And so to see a very crisp, perfect image, Hubble is still a great resource. Um, adaptive optics on the Earth is a way that, that big ground-based telescopes, ground-based as in on the Earth telescopes rather than satellites in space, have been able to try to get closer to correcting for our atmosphere. But still, space has many, many perks that, that scientists are happy to use. Um, as far as specific results recently, one doesn't immediately come to mind, but it's included a lot in results. Was the Redshift 11 galaxy? Yeah, yeah th that was something I'm interested in, so I thought that was pretty cool. So one thing Hubble can do is it can see basically like some of the farthest, well basically the farthest away galaxies that you can actually measure. And so uh, because, you know, it's above the Earth's atmosphere, it can see small things and it can see really faint things. And it has, like, they put in some new cameras recently that are actually really good at seeing those really old galaxies. So, yeah, so it's, it's basically looking at, like, the oldest galaxies in the universe. So that's pretty exciting. I'm interested in those personally, so, yeah. So uh, these astronomers, they had been going through um, archive data, so data taken by uh, Hubble and other telescopes for a very long time. And um, we take this data and not all of it is, com you know, looked through completely. So they were looking for galaxies, older galaxies, through all of this data. And what they found at like a higher redshift than they were expecting. They were seeing galax um, spiral galaxies that were much bigger than you would expect at that time. Uh, so yeah, that's the super, yeah, they're super big. Like. So you have to understand, like these, some of these images have thousands of galaxies, and actually more than thousands. Like some of them are just like one pixel, right? So it takes time. Like uh, for example, my advisor uh, did a program called the Cosmos, where they used Hubble to look at the same field on the sky that's about two degrees squared uh, field, and it, um, I forget how many orbits that was of Hubble. I think it was like 2,000 or 2,500 orbits, and it just kept on looking at the same place for a very long time, and that was like basically an empty space in the sky where you don't have a lot of stars, and so when they kept on looking at it, uh, they found like all of these galaxies. That's how they found the Redshift 11 galaxies. Like you have to keep looking in w on one part of the sky for a very long time, so that one photon that makes up that galaxy gets to you. To the so that's, and so you take a lot of images and you don't go through all of the images all the time and that's what they, they were doing. They were looking through archive data and they found like a couple of these massive uh, spiral galaxies. They don't know why that is the case or why they're even there. They, it will take time to figure that out uh, because we find new things about how galaxies evolve to be what they look like today. We're still studying that, so, they, so it's, it's pretty new, and I, I don't think the people who found it also know. Well, yeah, and you guys should look it up because it's gorgeous. It's the Hubble deep field, and they have images of it, and it's just amazing. The Hubble what? Deep field? Deep field. Yeah, and it's just, it's, it's gorgeous. Hmm? Actually, no. Uh, it's not exactly like changing the camera. It's 
basically changing what the camera is doing. So like they put in a new camera, some instruments, because Hubble went in what, um, up on 89? Uh, <laughs> no, 89 was when, okay, yeah. So, so it's been up for like more than 20 years. So it's, uh, cameras get old and um, we get better and better technology. So they put in newer um, cameras. So it's, the, I wouldn't say the resolution has changed that much. It's probably that it's looking at a different wavelength range or has different um, uh, properties of what it's looking at. So for instance, in the last uh, Hubble servicing mission, the and it is the last Hubble servicing mission, we will not be going back to Hubble to repair it again or anything like that. They put what's called the cosmic origin spectrograph. So we've been talking a lot about cameras, but that's not all of what astronomy is. It's not just about taking pictures of things. It's also about trying to figure out the wavelength of the light that we get from different sources. And the way that you do that, you know, the, the nice way of thinking about it is holding up a prism and it splits the light into its component parts in their different colors and different wavelengths. But there are more complex and sophisticated ways of doing this with grisms and gratings and that sort of thing. So uh, the cosmic origin spectrograph is a, is a spectrograph that splits light into its component parts, but it's all in the UV part of the spectrum. And the reason that that's special is because we can't see uh, UV light from the surface of the Earth because our atmosphere is pretty effective at blocking that. Fortunately for life on Earth, it's effective at blocking that because UV light is not so good for biological uh, systems. But in order to see this, you need a spacecraft. And there have been some previous uh, spacecrafts. There was one that was headed out of Caltech called Galax that was a UV spectrograph and a uh, UV photometry. But um, to answer, uh, again, a long answer to a short question, uh, the, one of the recent instruments that was put on it, I think there have been about, there were five servicing missions, I think, and I think in all of, most of the time in the servicing mission, uh, yes, you want to change the instruments and the cameras, but you also want to change the thing that keeps the telescope running. You want to service to make sure the gyros are able to, to rotate the, cam uh, the, the, t the telescope itself. Uh, so that was done, but I think probably in all five of those missions there was some sort of change of cameras, but in the most recent one there was this UV spectrograph that was put on. So. Sorry, that was a long, long answer. Oh, I like the long answer. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, it doesn't. Um, basically, it's in, you know, totally different wavelength range from what we're looking at. Are so, there optical telescopes here, though? Um, so they actually don't have that many optical telescopes right at the South Pole. Um, they have, because the atmosphere actually isn't that great for optical astronomy. But um, it's just because the atmosphere isn't as smooth there, so there's, like, much more turbulence. And you know how stars twinkle and you can kind of see that they're distorted? That's kind of the stuff that you get around by going to Hubble. Um, but uh, the atmosphere being more turbulent causes more of that, and there's a lot of that at the South Pole, but there's some other places in Antarctica where the atmosphere is smoother, where they could put optical telescopes, but they're also much, much harder to get to. Um, so, yeah. But the aurora are pretty to look at for the people that spend the winter working on the telescopes, but they don't disturb our observations at all. Yeah. And there's actually, there's a, a researcher from our department who's on the third floor, and only named Christine Moran, uh, who is at the South Pole right now, working on the South Pole Telescope. Uh, she's there for the entire Austral winter and won't be... You, once you're there at this point, you can't leave <laughs> until November because it's just too cold and your plane's fuel will freeze and the fuel lines and you'll be stuck there. So she's there working on the telescope. I think there's a, a skeleton crew of something like 40 people there who remain over the winter. Have you been to the South Pole? And Oh, I have been three times. It's pretty awesome. It's white everywhere. Um, <laughs> there's snow. <laughs> I mean, it's it's. So the South Pole is kind of a small base. So even in the summer, so there's 40 people in the winter. Um, even in the summer, when most of us go down there, there's only like 200 people total, and that's kind of at a maximum. So all the scientists basically fly down in October, November and do the camera servicing. So we go in, we work pretty hard because we only have three months to do it. Um, you know, put in new cameras, oil bearings of the telescope because they also, their oil gets old and freezes because it's sometimes like minus 100 there. 
Um, it's really cold, but they give you all of these really awesome outfits. Maybe I can bring them when I have my thing next time. That'd be cool. Um, yeah, so they give you a big jacket and they give you a bunch of down overalls and a bunch of gloves and hats and, you know, you fly down there. So when you're down there during the summer doing the regular work, it's like somewhere around minus 20 to minus 40 Fahrenheit, so it's cold. <laughs> um, but you can still go outside and we actually do work on the telescope outside when we're wearing all of that gear. Um, yeah, it really does. I think that it, uh, you know, it's rated for like minus 100, so you feel pretty warm. Yeah. <laughs> so. okay. Any other questions? I guess it's getting pretty late. It's interesting. Oh, yeah. yeah, thanks everyone. <laughs> hey, you guys had a really good question. <laughs>